All right, BC, assignment 10, unit 10, assignment 10. It's a free response assignment. It's our last BC specific assignment. Get ready for a practice test, AP test. So this has a bunch of good BC specific free response questions on it. It says GC and that's graph and calculator. So um, object moving along a curve in the x, y plane is at position x, t, y, t at time t with dx, dt, dy, dt. So they're giving you, this is two-dimensional motion, parametrics, time is greater than or equal zero, time zero. This is the position. So this is your x, zero, and this is your y, zero. Note the inverse tangent equals arctan, vice versa. So um, the fact this is a graph and calculator, and those are some kind of gross equations that I don't really know if I'm going to be able to integrate. I don't think I know how to integrate arctan. I know the derivative of arctan. I don't think I can integrate this natural log of the t squared inside. So we're for sure going to have to use our calculator besides just probably wanting to. And we're probably going to have to do multiple calculations with these. So I'm going to go ahead and take the time to enter these in one time to make sure they're correct. And also, so I don't have to redo it again. Every time I need to do a calculation, I can use table to get values. I can do derivative, math eight, math nine. So now I'm not gonna graph it. I'm just putting them in there right now. A says, find the speed of the object at time four. So speed for parametrics. Again, it's good to know how parametrics works. You're breaking down your, ec you're breaking down your overall velocity vector into Vx and Vy components forms a right triangle. The magnitude of your velocity, which doesn't take direction into account, be like the length of this vector, be the Thagrin theorem, that's the hypotenuse. So it's gonna be the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared. Okay, so if you want the speed at time four, then we're gonna do the square root of inverse tangent of four over five squared plus natural log of 17 squared. Point breakdown, by the way, is one, two, three, three out of nine. So now I could, I don't know, I could use table and stuff for this. I think this will be easy enough to just type around real quick. Second square root, parentheses, inverse tan. I'm putting these extra parentheses with inverse tan so I make sure it gets squared afterwards, plus parentheses, natural log of 17, close, close, squared, close. 2.912 round truncated three decimal accuracy. That's your one point. You either get it or you don't. Probably should show your work setting it up. B total distance traveled. Well, distance since last year in Calc A B was the integral of speed. And it is still the integral of speed. And we just got done talking about speed. So probably should show your setup. We're going from zero to four. Um, we'll point for the setup. We'll point for the answer. Now I'm gonna take advantage of the fact that I entered these into my calculator. I'm gonna do math nine, square root, bars, y bars function, y one squared, plus bars, y bars function, y bars, y bars function y2 squared, close parentheses, comma x, comma zero, comma four. And we get 6.423, round truncated, three decimal accuracy. No units on this problem. There you go, one point for your setup, one point for your answer. C. Find x4. Now this is a very 
Not surprising kind of question. We use this a lot of times. We need to use fundamental thermocalculus because you're not integrating that by hand. Even if you could, you don't want to. Got a calculator. Take advantage of it. So we're going to integrate x prime dt from what we know times 0 to time 4. Now it's going to give us x4 minus x0. So x4 is going to equal x0 plus the integral 0 to 4 of inverse tan of, I guess we could say time over 1 plus t dt. And we're just going to put that on our calculator. x0 was negative 3. Guarantee all that writing is going to be worth a good chunk of points. So, the no theorem of calculus part 1, negative 3, plus math 9. Vars, y bars function, y1, comma x, comma 0, comma 4. There you go. Negative 0 0.892, rounded, truncated, three decimal, actually it comes out the same. That was three points. So you're getting one point for using the initial condition, and you get another point for your integral, and then you get another point for your answer. Now, if you don't have this or you mess that up and you get the wrong answer, you probably lose two out of three points. You guys had it right. D, for a time gradient zero, there is a point on the curve where the line tangent of the curve has slope of two. So tangent to curve, t gradient zero, slope equals two. At what time t is the object at this point? And then find the acceleration vector, which is common because you got two components to it, x component, y component. So we gotta figure out first where this is happening. So we go, well, what's the slope of the curve? Slope of the tangent. It's always dy dx for parametrics, Cartesian, polar. Now the way you find it is a little different for each. So let's see what we get. I'm going to set it equal to two. Then we're going to solve this. Now, it's up to you how you want to solve it. I personally like moving everything to one side equals zero. I find that to be the easiest way to solve on my calculator. And generally, even without a calculator. So I'm going to move the two over here. Now I'm going to use my calculator. I'm going to graph that one um, equation. So... Let's see, let's put that in our calculator. I'm gonna to go to the Y menu. I'm gonna turn these off. I could, in fact, I could use those. I could say, you know what? My new equation is gonna be natural log on top, Y2 divided by bars, Y bars, Y1 minus two. Go to window. I expect the answer to be at zero and on. Let's just say zero to 10. I think we're looking for I don't know, it says it only happens once, so. And then I really just want to see the x-axis. So I don't need to see this whole graph, I just need to see its x-intercepts, because that, that'll be the solution to this equation. Let's grab it. <coughs> there it is. So what I do now is I say second count is zero. It's between uh, one and two, guess 1.5. And we get 1.3576631. Now I'm writing actually decimal places because we're going to use this to calculate another answer that will need to be three, three decimal accurate when we're done. Um, it says at what time? So I'm going to say uh, the time equals 1.357. Okay, there's no units on this. Don't put seconds. Um, I have this just for you know my work. So I got to find the acceleration vector. The acceleration vector at time 1.3576631 is just going to be the second derivative at that time for x and then separately for y. 
So let's let our calculator do all this work for us. I'm sure we could do a lot of it by hand. I can take the derivative of these, no problem, to get the second derivative, but my calculator can do it really fast for me. So on my calculator, I'm going to go back to the home screen and I'm going to do math eight bars, y bars function, y1, comma x, comma 1.3576631. There's your 0 0.135 acceleration x direction. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to check, change the y1 to bars, y bars function, y2, enter. 0 0.955 and that's your answer this is the acceleration at 1.357 that's point you got a point for writing this you got a point for getting the time <clears throat> actually probably writing this equal to two point so there you go not that bad i i kind of I kind of feel like parametrics aren't bad. I feel like if we have really solid uh, you know, understanding of one-dimensional motion, it's uh, we're just trying to make it you know work for two dimensions. Number three, polar. Now polar is definitely kind of a whole new thing, but we end up doing a lot of the same kinds of things we did with other our other coordinate system, but we just have to figure out how it works with angles and radius instead of X and Y. So uh, the graphs of polar curves R equals two, by the way, that's a, that's a circle. That's a polar circle, but there's other polar circles that we usually do that are like offset. And then there's this one, three plus two cosine theta. Now, whenever you have these two numbers, it's not going to be a circle or a rose curve. It's going to be like a limason of some kind. Um, it could be a cardioid if these are equal. And then if these aren't equal, then you get, to, you get a couple variations. You get like a limason with an inner loop, or you get uh, a dimpled limason or convex limason. So th that's one of these right here. Not that you need to know that, but in anything that's cosines oriented left to right. So they usually give you the graphs, but it's kind of nice to, you need to know which one is which, probably for multiple things. So it might be good to label these. So as the curves intersect <clears throat> at, 2 pi over 3, which looks about right. Looks like about 2 pi over 3, right? And 4 pi over 3. I like to draw those angles because they show you where things stop. They could easily make you ask you to find those. So this is a graphing category problem. It's easy to solve for the intersection of curves, just like you would solve for the intersection of curves in Cartesian. Set the r's equal to each other and find the theta. A, let R be the region that is inside the graph of the circle and also inside the graph of the other one. So it's a shaded area. Find the area. Now, when we find the area, we can only find the area of one curve at a time. So what we do is if there's an area that's formed by two different curves, it's like one part of the curve, this part of the curve is formed just by the circle part until we get to here and then we use the other one. So that's how we break it up. Now the area, is always going to be one half r squared d theta. For us, we're going to go one half, we're going to go theta equals zero to two pi over three of the circle, which is constant radius of two. And then we're going to add one half zero. Now, by the way, I'm taking a symmetric approach, by the way, we don't have to. I'll, I'll show you the other way you can set it up. This one's going to be 2 pi over, th so this one starts at 2 pi over 3 and ends at pi. It gives you this little area right here. And that radius is 3 plus 2 cosine theta squared d theta. That gives you half the area, so then we would double it, which is common strategy. It's usually easier. Otherwise, you could not double it, and you could say, I'm going to go from here to here. Now, you got to go. From, you got to go from negative 2 pi over 3 to positive 2 pi over 3 of 2 squared d theta. If you want to get that chunk of circle, if you go 2 pi over 3 to 4 pi over 3, you're going to get 
this chunk of the area of the circle. We want this backwards area and you want to go from smaller to bigger. Otherwise, if you go backwards, you're going to get a negative answer. So you'd have to do that one like that. And then the other one would be two pi over three to four pi over three of three plus two cosine theta squared. So you could do it like that too. I feel like this is easier. Uh, the twos cancel. Um, we're just going to use our calculator to do this. So uh, we're going to do, and also, by the way, this is just a, a, a fraction of a circle. So you could say, well, this is uh, two thirds of a circle. So I'm going to do two thirds of pi r squared. And I'll give you the same thing here. So that's another option here is that I'm going to say two thirds of a circle, which is pi r squared. I, and it, it gives the same answer. Let me show you. Uh, math nine um, of four comma x comma zero comma two pi over three. Oops. Okay, and then what's uh, what's two thirds times four pi? Same thing. Okay, plus math nine of parentheses three plus two cosine x, we're putting x's in for the thetas, you get to close the cosine, close that whole expression, then square it, comma x, comma, um, two pi over three, comma, pi. So I added that to the previous one, so the whole answer should be 10.370 round truncated three decimal place accuracy. That's, that's your answer. Now the point breakdown here is four, two, and three. That's a lot of points for part A. One point for the answer, <clears throat> one point for the limits and constant, uh, one point for the integrand. So one point for this limit and constant, I think, maybe. And then, uh, or one point for that whole thing, one point for this uh, constant limits, one point for the integrand. That was a lot of points. A particle moving with non-zero velocity, that means it's not going to be zero. It could be positive or negative. Along the polar curve, given by r equals 3 plus 2 cosine theta, so that's that bigger one, has position x, t, y, t. So they're mixing parametrics with polar right now. They're saying there's a particle moving along that curve that has x and y position at time t. With theta equals zero, when t equals zero, so that's your initial condition, or it's kind of like theta and t are interchangeable. And this particle moves along the curve so that dr dt equals dr d theta. Find the value of dr dt at theta equals pi of three and interpret your answer in terms of the motion of the particle. Well, let's find dr dt first. Now dr dt equals dr d theta. dr d theta is this r taking its derivative with respect to theta. So that's going to be a negative two sine theta. So dr dt at time at theta equals pi over three is going to be negative two sine of pi over three. Now we do have a calculator, but I feel like, I don't know, I feel confident. Uh, sine looks like this, right? So zero uh, pi over six, pi over four, pi over three. So one half root two over two, root three over two, first quadrant. So it equals negative root three. All right, no, no units. Okay, so we get that. Now you could you could have done this on your calculator if you want to. So that's point. And then they say interpret it. Well, this is the change in r as theta progresses, or the change in r as time progresses, right? So. Since r, since dr dt is negative, that means that r is decreasing. Now, what we usually interpret that as is that the particle is getting closer to the pole or the origin. But there's two things that have to be true. The radius has to be positive while dr dt is negative. Because if the radius is negative and dr dt is negative, the radius is get more negative, which is actually getting further from the origin. So I think we need to establish 
what the R value at pi over three is also. Probably write it down to show we know. <laughs> because this is critical to our interpretation. If you don't mention this, I don't think you can credit for it. Cosine pi over three is one root three over two, root two over two, one half. So that's four. Okay. So it is positive, which the picture kind of indicates. That's good to show it. So I'm going to say, um, since the radius is decreasing because dr d theta equals negative root three is specifically negative and the radius is positive r r equals four um, the particle is moving towards the origin. So that's B, two points, one point for this and one point for all of this. So if you totally get stuck on that, eh, that's one point. Okay, part C says, for the particle described in part B, so let's keep taking this, dy dt equals dy d theta. Find the value of dy dt at theta equals pi over three. Interpret your answer in terms of the motion particle. So this is similar. Let's have dr d theta, dr dt, we're doing dy dt. So that's just the vertical motion. Um, so um, first of all, we need to write down what x and y are for polar curves. So x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. Now we specifically are interested in uh, y and the r is the three plus two cosine theta sine theta. And so we wanna do dy dt at theta equals pi over three equals dy d theta at theta equals pi over three equals this derivative three plus two cosine pi over three times derivative of sine is cosine plus sine. Oh, I guess we've got a bit pi over threes in here. We could have done the separately and then plug pi over threes in. Times derivative of this would be negative two sine theta. And so, and oh, we can put this in our calculator, Let's see what it gives us. Um, or we could do it by hand. I mean, whatever, either way. Cosine pi over three is one half. One half. Sine pi over three is root three over two. Root three over two. So this is gonna be three plus one is four times one half. Uh, minus two times three over four. So that's gonna give you two, it's a two. So it's gonna be um, two minus three halves. So it's gonna be negative one half or positive, positive one half. If you do it on a calculator, it'd give you like point. My calculator, it gives me 0 0.5000004167. So calculators aren't perfect. They're using their own estimation techniques. In fact, they're using series to uh, truncated Taylor polynomials. Um, so we got our answer. One half, 0 0.500, so that's point. Um, in fact, I think writing this y equation right here is worth a point. Good reason to do it, not just to make your work easier, but because you might get points for it. You gotta write all this stuff down. You better label it. Label all your work, show your work. And as far as interpreting it in terms of the motion of the problem, well, it's not going towards the origin now because we're not talking about r changing, which r is the distance to origin. We're talking about y changing, 
y is up and down, it's positive. So that means y is moving upwards, right? It's moving upwards. Is it going, but then usually what we want to do is kind of talk, well, is it going towards the x-axis or away from the x-axis? Again, you need to know the position of the particle at the same time and combine it with the velocity to get the whole picture. So y of pi over 3 is going to be 3 plus 2 cosine pi over 3 sine pi over 3. That's 1 half. That's 1. That's 4 times root 3 over 2 is 2 root 3, which is positive. So because the y coordinate is positive and it's moving up, it's moving upwards and away from the x-axis. Okay? So the particle is moving upwards and away from the x-axis since uh, dy dt is positive and y is positive at theta equals pi over 3, so something like that. All right, so that whole last chunk, that was the point. So there's, there's, uh, there's polar. And, you know, I think, you know, once you get the hang of polar, it's usually, I mean, there's a couple weird questions there. Okay, let's see. Here we go. Consider differential equation. Now, my guess, just if, if it's BC and I see differential equation, I'm thinking they might throw a logistic at me or they might throw Euler's method at me in the middle of this, okay? So they're giving you the first derivative, differential equation. They want the second derivative in terms of x and y, which is nice because then we can do it implicitly. So part A is really uh, an AB kind of thing, just taking the second derivative. <clears throat> so dy dx equals 3x plus 2y plus 1. So the second derivative is going to be a derivative of this with respect to x, right? Um, this isn't good enough because they want it in terms of x and y, not d, dy, dx. So what we can do is we're going to replace this into there, parentheses, 3x plus 2y plus 1. And, you know, might be nice to simplify it. So that would be uh, 6x plus 4y plus 5 equals the second derivative. So this was a point and this was a point. Two points. Point breakdown is 2, 3, 2, 2. So that wasn't too bad. B says find the values of the constants m, b, and r for which y equals mx plus b e, uh, plus e to the rx is a solution to the differential equation. So usually we solve differential equations, right? And so what are we going to do here? There's, I don't know, there could be a couple different ideas. We could just try and solve this differential equation and then see if we get something that's like this and try and figure out the values. Or we could take the derivative of this and set it equal to the derivative that we've been given. That seems like the easier way to do it, right? If this is a solution, then its derivative should match that derivative. So from this, um, let's see. I mean, do we... Now, now, the problem is this just has x's in it. Usually, so this this equation they gave us the solution was like a explicit equation, which usually is what we try and get. So I guess what we need to do is then if we're setting these equal to each other, we need to get this all in terms of x. So we're going to replace that y with, uh, with x. So we're going to put an mx plus b plus e to the rx in there. So this is a little weird. So we're going to get um, 
3x plus 2mx plus 2b plus 2e to the rx plus 1. Now, uh, this is a strategy that we use back in like Algebra 2 to solve like complex numbers, solution uh, equations with the complex numbers. So what you do is you say, oh, well, let's match these guys up, right? Because So, oh, R has to, these have to equal each other because that's the only E, the Rx stuff on both sides, which means that R has to equal two. Okay, that works. Now, uh, let's see. So after that, then we could focus on, there are no X terms over here, right? So that must mean that zero equals X times three plus two M, right? Which means that three plus two M must equal zero. And so M must equal negative three halves, right? And the M is just like a non-X term. It should be matched up to all the other non-X terms, the 2B and the plus 1. And we just found M, so we would need to find M first. And then we can use this to solve B. So this is going to be negative 5 halves equals 2B. B equals uh, negative 5 fourths. So that was kind of weird. Now there is one other possibility. Um, so you could have done that. The other possibility is that it is possible that if R, if R equals zero, no. If R equals zero, then these just drop out. So there's a possibility that if r equals zero, so this is the other possibility, this is kind of a weird problem. If r equals zero, then the equation becomes m uh, zero times e to the one is zero equals three x plus two m x plus two b, and then this e to the zero is one, so there's a two left there. And then we do the same thing, zero equals x times three plus 2m, so 3 plus 2m equals 0, so m equals negative 3 halves. So we get that, but then the m value is set equal to 2b plus 3, and so then we plug negative 3 halves in for that, and then we subtract 3, which would be negative 9 halves, and then b equals negative 9 fourths. So this is an alternate possible solution. You didn't have to find both of them, but a lot of algebra, a lot of algebra tricks there. Um, but you got a point for doing this. You got a point for finding R, which is kind of one of the easier ones, and then a point for the rest of the solution, B and M. All right, C. Nothing really BC about that. C says, let fx be a particular solution to the difference equation with initial condition. F0, negative 2. Use Euler's method, starting x equals 0, with step size 1 half to approximate f1. Show the work that leads to your answer. Okay, so we're not solving this the particular solution. We're using, we're trying to get an estimate for it. Solving, solving the difference equation to find the particular solution to find the exact answer. We might not even be able to do it. So, yeah, you can't even separate these variables. So you know you're not going to even be able to solve this. But we're going to use Euler's method to estimate it. So Euler's method is just <clears throat> repeated tangent line approximations. So delta x equals 1 half. We're trying to find f1, um, an approximation for it, um, using tangent line. So y minus negative 2 equals, um, we need the slope at 0, negative 2. So 0 for x, negative 2 for y. So that's going to be negative 3. So that's your slope, negative 3, x minus your x value. So y equals negative 3x minus 2. So we're going to use that. We're going to say, okay, well, f of 
1 half, taking two equal steps to get to 1, would be approximately y at 1 half, which would be 3 times 1 half minus 2. So that's negative 3 halves, that's negative 7 halves is your approximate value for f 1 half. Okay, then you would do it again. You say, okay, well, we can do y minus negative 7 halves equals, we've got to find a new slope, dy dx for 1 half negative 7 halves using a differential equation we started with. So that's going to be 3 times x plus 2 times y uh, plus 1. So that's going to be 3 halves minus 14 halves is minus 11 halves plus two halves is minus nine halves is your slope. So then we're gonna, we're gonna get negative nine halves x plus nine fourths minus 14 fourths, so it's gonna be minus five fourths. So then f of one is approximately equal to y of one plugged in here. 18, negative 23 fourths or negative 5.75, but that's your answer. Or you could try that table thing, but I don't know. I feel like that's a little risky, especially for your response. And it's only two steps. Uh, if you can't do this, then you're gonna mess the table up too for sure and get zero credit. At least you're getting a couple points here. Um, D says, but y equals gx be another solution difference equation with initial condition g0 equals k, where k is a constant. Euler's method starting x equals 0 with step size 1 gives approximation. So Euler's step size of 1 starting at 0 gives g1 about 0. Find the value of k. Now, if we start at x equals 0, and we go to 1, and the step size is 1, how many steps is that? It's one step. So we're going to create a tangent line here for this. We're going to say, OK, well, we need the derivative, right, g prime at 0, which is going to be dy dx at 0, k. So you plug it in, 3 times 0, 0. You get 2k plus 1 is your slope. So we're going to do y minus k, it's a little weird, equals 2k plus 1 is your slope times x minus 0. And so from this, we get our tangent line 2k plus 1 x plus k. And then we're going to estimate g at 1, one step size. It's going to equal y at 1. So it's going to be 2k plus 1, plug 1 in for x plus k. And then they told us that the answer was 0. Okay. And then they said, what's k? Well, here you go. You have an equation to solve for k. You have, you have uh, 3k plus 1 equals 0. So 3k equals negative 1. So k equals negative 1 third. That was kind of weird. I don't really know how much, how much the table would have worked to help you for there. You got to understand what there's, uh, okay. So good little differential equation practice. Kind of seen a little bit of everything. Uh, next problem says, let F be this function, write the first four non-zero terms and the general term of the Taylor series for F about X equals zero, which means it's the like Warren series. And maybe we can use that to help us out, but we need the general term. A lot of times people forget the general term or they write it like totally separate in closed form. Nope, nope, should be open form. Shouldn't have that summation symbol. Um, shouldn't have the sigma in it. So let's take advantage of the fact that this is a McLaurin series, right? And we know that the sum of the power series is a over one minus r. 
So we could say, oh, well, this is your A, right? And that means that R must equal negative X squared. And so that means that the Taylor, the four, first four non-zero terms of the Taylor series, which means it's exact. So F of X equals two X over one plus X squared. The first term is gonna be two X. The next term is gonna be minus two X cubed. Next term is going to be plus 2x to the fifth. The next term is going to be minus 2x to the seventh. So that's the first four non-zero terms plus dot, dot, dot. Now, the general term is going to be uh, clearly alternating. So negative 1 to the, this is uh, like n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. So it's going to be uh, negative one to the n plus one, and then um, unless we're starting at zero, then I guess it just depends. Um, and this can be x to the two times n minus one, x to the two n minus one, and that's it, right? Plus dot 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 plus. And you kind of want that dot, dot, dot at the end there, too. So this is worth point breakdown 3, 1, 2, 3. So you got one point for getting two of these terms correct, and then another point for getting the rest of them correct, and another point for getting the general term correct. Now, you could have tried this a totally different way, where you take a bunch of derivatives over and over again and then create the Taylor polynomial that way. That should work. You're going to have to go all the way up to the seventh derivative, and it's going to get ugly. That's going to get ugly. So probably not realistic with a time restriction. B, does the series in found in part A, when evaluated at 1, converge for F1? Explain why or why not. So if we plug 1 in there, okay, um, x equals 1. Does it converge to f of 1? Does it converge to the answer? And that's the whole series. We just wrote the first four non-zero terms. That doesn't mean we're only using the first four non-zero terms. We wrote the general term, too. We're just, as, as an example, like, hey, here's what the first four non-zero terms are, but they're going to go forever. So this should be perfect if it converges. If it diverges, then it's not going to work. So probably got to use some kind of test or something. Um, so we could say, okay, well, F1 equals the actual function. You know, you could just plug one in and, and this is the answer. Okay, but that's not what we're asking. We got we to gotta do the series, N equals, I'm, I start at N equals one to infinity and use your general term that's what goes in the series. And that's where some people are like, oh, I want to put epsilon there. or something. No, don't do that. It's got to be in your own. So now we're dealing with, uh, let's see. And did I, oh, I missed something here. I probably would have lost point. All these terms have a two, right? They all have a two. Not to a power, just, just a two. So I would have lost point on that one. X to the... Um, 2n minus 1, okay? So if we plug 1 into this, it becomes a number series, right? So let's plug 1 in for all the x's. And what happens is that's just 1, right? And so this becomes uh, n equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 2. Now, I think, just think about it. Are those terms getting smaller, going to 0? No. Which means that by the nth term test, you got to name it. Show me how it works. The limit as n goes to infinity of negative 1 to the n plus 1 times two uh, just it equals plus or minus two, right? 
doesn't equal zero diverges. So that was kind of a weird, you know, way of asking us to do something that we do a lot. C says the derivative of natural log natural log of one plus x squared, the derivative of it equals two x over one plus x squared. Do you guys, do you agree? If you took a derivative of this, you get one over what's inside times the derivative of what's inside, chain rule, perfect, okay. They're telling us something that is obvious, but that'll make it even more obvious. Write the first four non-zero terms of the Taylor series for the natural log of one plus x squared about x equals zero. So that means this is the series we just wrote, right? This is the series, this was 2x minus 2x cubed plus 2x to the fifth minus 2x to the seventh plus dot 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 plus two times negative one to the n plus one x to the two n minus one plus dot dot dot. That equals that. If we want natural log of one plus x squared, then we're gonna have to integrate this. Right? So u substitution, one plus x squared du equals two x. This works, right? And then we're gonna have to integrate this. This is gonna be, uh, bump it up one power rule. If you go zero to x, okay? This is the work you wanna show. Put limits on it, definite. Cause we don't want this. <clears throat> Um, so we're going to get X squared, right? Minus two X to the fourth over four, right? We could have said two X squared over two plus two X to the sixth over six minus two X to the eighth over eight. First form non-zero terms. Do they ask for the general term? No plus dot, dot, dot. It's not a Taylor polynomial. We're just writing the first one on term, zero terms. That doesn't mean that's all we're using. We could clean this up. I mean, we could do the nth term, by the way, just in case we need it for something else. I mean, I wouldn't do it unless I look further, but uh, the nth term would be, now you can you can integrate or take derivatives of the nth term. Just be careful you don't, you don't confuse the n as being the thing you're integrating with respect to. It's the x. So all this n stuff stays the way it is. This one, we're going to bump the exponent up by one and then divide by the new exponent. So that's a general term. Now we could write this a little nicer, x squared minus x to the fourth over two plus x to the sixth over three minus x to the eighth over four. And you start to see like a whole nother pattern forming, right? Uh, plus um, here, the twos would reduce negative one to the n plus one x to the two n over n plus dot dot dot. So anyways, we often do this. We take series, we take derivatives of them, we integrate them to get new series. So that's two points. One point for two correct terms, one point for the other two correct. D says use a series found in part C to find a rational number A. Rational just means like a, a fraction, someone could rise a fraction, such that A minus natural log of five fourths is less than one hundredth. Justify your answer. Now, when you see something like that, I think you should think um, like that's, a, that's like error. They're like showing you error right there. When they say there's some A that we're trying to find, where absolute value of a minus natural log of five fourths is less than some number. This is usually if you have absolute value of something minus something involving series, that's like, this is like the estimate and this is the actual value. And then it's less than something because this is your, this, this whole thing equals your error. This is the exact error. And then this is the error bound like a, estimate worst case scenario for your error. So you need to recognize that because that's what we're trying to do. Now, is this an alternate series? It is, that makes things a little easier. Um, now, this is the actual value. We want the error to be less than 100th. Um, so 
we know that the error for an alternate series is the next term. So let's keep writing terms until we know that the next term will be less than 100th, okay? So we're gonna, we're using this series right here, natural log. Now we're plugging specifically in, it says, it says we're doing five fourths, but that doesn't mean we should be plugging five fourths in because this is natural log of, that means this whole thing, one plus x squared equals five fourths, which means that x squared equals one fourth, which means that x equals one half, plus or minus one half, right? So we're plugging one half in squared, right? And so we're taking natural log of five fourths, right, which equals this, and then we're gonna estimate it by taking as many terms as we need to. So the, so the first term is gonna be one half squared, which gives you one fourth, okay? Minus one half to the fourth power times one half. So that's gonna be 16, that's gonna be one over 32. Is that less than 100, 100th yet? Nope plus uh, plus one half to the sixth power times one third. So that's gonna be 32, 64 times three is 192. Oh yeah, yeah, this is less than, is less than uh, 100th, right? So that means we're gonna take the first two terms as our estimate. Okay, because if we do, then we know that the error will be less than 1 over 192, which is definitely less than 1 over 100. Right? And so we might say, we might say something, you know, since it's an, you know, alternating converging alternating series. Um, let me see what they said on there. So they, they added this to the scoring guidelines. They said since the series is a converging alternating series and the absolute values of the individual terms decrease to zero. So that kind of sounds like the alternating series test for convergence then, I don't know, then they're saying, you know, A minus natural log of five fourths has to be less than the next term I mean, so they wrote that stuff, I don't know, they wrote that um, So, I don't know you might kind of try and explain why you're allowed to use that error bound because it's an alternate series. But that last part was worth three points. You could totally lose, you know, average six out of nine points, be on course to barely get a five if you do that on all of them. Hopefully there's some free response problems that you get all the points on, right? Okay, last problem, and we so we've done like every kind of BC problem you'll see on the response. So if we're gonna do one of them twice, it seems like uh, it seems like a series problem might be a good one. Okay, so the McLaurin series for e of the x is this. Okay, we have that memorized. It says the continuous function for f is defined by this where x cannot be one, if it is, you get division by zero, so that kind of makes sense. They give you initial condition, the function f has derivatives at all orders of x, just in case, hopefully we don't have to take them all. Uh, a says write the first 
for non-zero terms and the general term for the Taylor series for e to the x minus 1 squared. So that's just part of this. Sometimes what they do is they kind of lead you through and help you start building this up. About x equals 1. So this is the center. Now, um, this is kind of tricky because they're talking about a McLaurin. This is the McLaurin series, right? You see all these x minus 1s in here? So anywhere x shows up, if there's an x minus 1, then it's centered at 1. But we can actually use, for the e of the x term, we can use the McLaurin series and plug an x minus 1 in. I don't know if we've really talked about that. Because I feel like it usually doesn't work. But we can plug an x minus 1 in. Um, x minus 1 squared. For all the x's. Now, if you weren't sure, you could take the derivatives. So maybe I'll try that in a second and see if that gives you the same thing. It's probably going to be a good amount of extra work. We could uh, write this a little nicer. Now, I don't think we're going to want to expand those bin binomials. Okay, um, so I'm just cleaning this up. I do want to try it the other way, which I'm sure should work. I just don't know how crazy the work is going to be, but I'll, I'll do it right now. So this is one way to do it, which I don't know if I would have thought about doing that that way because I would have been like, well, that's centered about one, and that's for McLaurin series. But the fact they brought it up kind of seems to th should make you think that they want you to use it. So um, you could do that. Um, let's try it the other way. We could say, well, the zeroth derivative, we're going to only have to go up to, well, I'm going to have to go up to the sixth derivative. So it's going to be a fair amount of work. So the zeroth derivative is the original function e to the x minus 1 squared. And then the first derivative is going to be uh, it's going to be that, and then the derivative of this, 2x minus 1 to the first power, so e to the x minus 1 squared. They're not too bad yet, but on the second derivative, we've got to start doing product rule. So we got 2x minus 1 times the derivative of this is going to be 2x minus 1 e to the x minus 1 squared plus um, the derivative of this, which is just 2 e to the x minus 1 squared. The third derivative is going to be, um, we could make this 4x minus 1 squared times the derivative of this is going to give you 2x minus 1 e to the x minus 1 squared plus uh, the derivative of this, which would be 8 x minus 1 times uh, e to the x minus 1 squared plus, we haven't even done this derivative right here, 4e to the x minus 1 squared. Now, the only thing that might save us is there might be like a pattern here, you know? So like this is, if we clean this up, we get uh, 8x minus 1 cubed e to the x minus 1 squared plus 8 x minus 1 e to the x minus 1 squared plus 4 e to the x minus 1 squared. I mean, I don't know if we'd have to multiply these all out to see the pattern. I don't know if I quite see a pattern yet. This would be 4 x minus 1 squared e to the x minus 1 squared plus 2e to the x minus 1 squared. So um, I mean, the only thing I see happening here is this 2 to the first, 2 to the first. This is 2 cubed cubed. This is, this is 2 squared squared. And then you get a 2 to the first. And then 
Um, here you get a two squared and here we got a two to the zero. So like is the next one, I would guess, the next one would be 16 x minus one to the fourth e to the x minus one squared plus 16 x minus one squared maybe e to the x minus one squared. And this one might be eight e to the x minus, one. I don't know. I'm not sure if that's the wise thing to do, but we have to go all the way up to the sixth derivative. So that's gonna be a lot of work. I'm not gonna do all that right now. You can, you can see how that goes. I have it right here. And then you gotta plug, you gotta plug one into all of these. And uh, you get a one, a zero, and then a two, and then a zero and then a 12 and then i think i think i gave up that or i saw a pattern uh this was two factorial no i don't know anyways that's depressing trying it that way okay B, use the Taylor series found in part a to write the first four non-zero terms in the general term of the Taylor series for f so we did part of it. So now if we're gonna do the whole Taylor series, e to the x minus one squared minus one over x minus one squared, what we can do is we can just we can just put those in there. We can just do one plus x minus one squared plus x minus one to the fourth over two plus x minus one to the sixth over six plus dot 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 plus x minus one to the two nth over n factorial plus dot 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 all and then minus one and then divided by x minus one squared. Now I think we could simplify this. Um, what you'll notice is this one and this negative one cancel each other out which is really nice because then all these terms have an x minus one squared at least in them and we're going to get one plus x minus one squared over two plus x minus one to the fourth over six plus we would need the next one I guess x minus one I think it would have been to the uh, the eighth over four factorial so it's gonna be a sixth over four factorial um, which is gonna be 24 plus dot 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 plus x minus one to the two n minus two over n factorial plus dot dot dot. So it's kind of interesting that we can easily build that Taylor series. Um, C. Use the ratio test to find interval convergence for the Taylor series found in part B. So I think the hardest about, part about this problem is part A. The, and then the bad part of that is that we keep having to use it for the next parts, which means things are going to get really ugly probably if we made some mistake or something. Or we got to have something to work with from part A. So C is the ratio test. So we can take the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of x minus one to the, now we plug it in plus one in there, you get two n plus two minus two, so we just get two n over n plus one factorial divided by times n factorial over x minus one to the two n minus two. So then we could simplify this you guys should know how to simplify factorials. Rules of exponents say that if I subtract this from this, I'm gonna get a positive two. So I'm gonna get the limit as n goes to infinity of absolute value of x minus one squared over n plus one. Now that is gonna to go to zero, which is for sure less than one, which means that it converges everywhere, any value of x, so this is kind of a rare outcome, but it happens. We've seen it happen before. So the interval of convergence is all real numbers.
or we could say negative infinity, positive infinity. So kind of interesting. That's nice though. You should love that because then you don't have to test endpoints, which is like half the work at least I feel like for interval of convergence for a power source. D use the Taylor series for F. So we're doing a Taylor series for F centered at X equals one to determine whether the graph of F has any points of inflection. <laughs> okay. So the Taylor, the Taylor series for F about X equals one is what we wrote earlier, right? So we, you know, that's, that's what we have. That's one plus X minus one square root of two plus X minus one to the fourth over six plus X minus one to the sixth over 24 plus dot 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 plus X minus one to the two n minus two over n factorial. So we're going to take the derivative and then the second derivative of it and hopefully we'll try and find some inflection points. So the derivative of this net zero, <clears throat> two comes in front, you get X minus one to the first power, right? plus four x minus one cubed over six plus six x minus one to the fifth over 24 plus dot 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 plus we can take derivatives of this it's gonna be two n minus two x minus one to the two n minus three for n factorial so then let's take the second derivative and that's going to just give you a one there plus 12 x minus 1 squared over 6 plus 30 x minus 1 to the fourth over 24 plus dot 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 plus 2n minus 2 2n minus 3 x minus 1 to the 2n minus 4 over n factorial plus dot 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 so that's not hard to do we we can do that now by the way, you get one point for that. The point breakdown, I think this is going to be a total of two points. So you just get one point for doing that. Now, inflection points um, are where concavity changes sign, right? So you got to think, well, um, are there any values of x or even depend, independent of x where this is going to change signs? Look at this. No matter what n is, n's always a positive number, zero or more. All the stuff in, with n's is going to be positive. No matter what you plug in for x, it's going to get squared, raised to an even power. So it's going to be forced to be positive. Like this is always positive. So there's no inflection points. So... Since all terms are to even powers, the sign will always be positive. The graph will always be concave up never changing concavity therefore it has no inflection points Kind of weird, a little strange. The thing about this problem that was the worst for me was that first thing there. So I guess if I were persistent enough, I could have kept going with this. I was just get I was just getting a little frustrated. I was doing fine, but it's just going to keep getting messier. You'd have to take three more derivatives just based off of this, you know, because you would have to say, well, let's plug you know, one into this and you get e to the zero, which is one. And then let's plug one into the first derivative, 
and that is actually zero. And then you say, let's plug one into the second derivative and that's gonna be zero, but then that's gonna be two. And then let's plug one into the third derivative. So that's gonna be zero, that's gonna be zero, and that's gonna be four or, yeah, is that right? Just double checking. No, I have that it's supposed to be zero. So I make, did I make a mistake? Yeah, I think I made a mistake here. Cause I was supposed to take the derivative of this. So that'd be four times X minus two E to the X minus one squared. So that would be zero. And then the fourth derivative, it looks like it's alter, it, it's we're missing every other term. So you'd probably get a number there. Fifth derivative is probably going to be zero. And then the sixth derivative, you would you get your last number. So for your first four non-zero terms, and then you have to figure out the pattern. So it's possible. So it would just be a lot, it'd be a lot of work. I mean, we're making it, but um, this was way easier. Um, I don't know if I would have felt comfortable doing that myself. But anyways, this was a really good assignment for a bunch of BC specific free response questions, which is generally three out of your six free response questions will be BC related. So always get a series question, get a polar or a parametric, and then you usually get a differential equation that might involve like Euler's method or logistic. All right.